Uh, in your books, it will be 1448. It's recording, it's record. Is that cool? Let us start with this question. What is a sin? Huh. Okay. Something that takes you away from Something that is wrong. Okay, no, no, that's not the answer I'm looking for. How do you know what is a sin? What's the first experience of a sin? You're going to sit on the Quran. What, what is the first human experience of a sin? Murder. No. <laughs> when you feel bad about something? No. Huh? When you feel bad about something? Ah. Al ithmu ma haka fi sadrik wa karihta. You got it. You got one right. One thing is right. A sin is something that pricks you. Because you feel it says this is bad. And you don't want others to know about it. Therefore, it is a sin if you have life is going to be your what? You don't want other people to know about it. Therefore, it is a secret. Secret. A sin is a secret. If you don't think something's a sin, it's never going to be a secret. You're always going to be okay with other people knowing about it. That's why the Prophet said, a sin is something that pricks your soul. And you dislike that other people know about it because... You treat it like a sin. I mean, if you did a sin, you're going to think twice before you tell your fiancé who you're going to marry, right? Because it's a secret. And you don't know how she's going to react to that, what? Secret. Now, in this, you will see, for those of you that know the Arabic language, what is the secret in the word haya? Haya means what? Haya. Ma mani haya, huh? Huh? Hay. Ma mani haya. Is a lie. Ah, modesty. Haya is what? Modesty. Is modesty in the sense not of what when we think of in terms of genders, but in terms of for, when you do something wrong, you have modesty about it, right? Mm -hmm. So the word life in Arabic is the same word as modesty. Okay? If you don't have modesty, the Prophet said, فَإِلَّمْ يَسْتَحْيِي If you don't have modesty, meaning if you don't feel shy for doing something wrong, if you, and not only the Prophet said this, the Prophet said that every Prophet told this people, if you're not shy, if you don't feel something is wrong, if you don't feel shy that people tell you that you're doing something wrong, you're like, I don't, you know, I killed people, so, you know, you don't feel shy about it, you don't feel shy about your wrongs, then if al then go ahead and do what you want. Yes? I have a question, like, uh, like you say now, Ibrahim who was Khalil Rahman. And then after that, the angel of death is turned of him. And he said, Ya Khalil Rahman, you grew up as Salam. came, and then Allah said, and then he stared. And then he said, Hal Khalil, Yakra Khalil. You know that. Yeah. And then Allah, he said to angel, tell him, because he's Khalil of Rahman. You know? Al Khalilu Yakra Lika Khalilu. Or you know, something like that. Yeah. Woman carry a lika Allah carry Allah Lika. Woman a hub lika Allah, hub Allah Lika. And uh, so anyway, a sin is something that what pricks you. So you, what is our first human experience of sin according to Freud 
And what is our first experience of sin according to Islamic tradition? Two questions. Because we're trying to combine some elements of modern psychology that fits and is synchronized and in, in, in sheds light on traditional Islam. So what is the first sin that you think that you did according to Freud? And what's the first sin is described as what? As a secret you don't want other people to know about, right? So what's the first thing that you did that in your life that would be considered sin? It was your first experience of sin. Is it different from everyone? Or are you it could be a little bit different, but generally every child goes through this phase. <laughs> Is it lying? Every child goes through doing this type of sin. Is it lying? Lying. You know it's lying is bad the minute you do it. Mm -hmm. And you usually, a lot of people remember the first time that they lied. Because it's, it's almost traumatic. Right? And there's this, and it's not like a big tra trauma. Oh, yeah. But it's like a mini trauma. Like, I just lied to my parents. Are they going to find out that I lied? Right? Mm -hmm. So you use... Um, Sure, I got a question. When when baby is going is going to be come and, and life in his mom, when his baby born, and sometimes you, you don't have any zam baby. Yeah, his, you don't baby child, don't You don't have any zam. You live the Allah fitra. Okay, and then when he started like teen and his his yurba. Right. Then, and then he gonna yes, yes, something yes. like that. Yeah. So, and then after that, Allah said, "Wa bilwani dini ihsana, wala tanharu, wala tukulhum kufkin, wala tukulhum All right. Somebody, you like, came from your parent, and then when you grow, and then you gonna find a way with them, you know, like, you know, like, talk too much and whatever. Let's take my wife and you gonna run away." Far away, and even she's they passed away, and you find prayer. You don't, you never say Allah, Allah offer him what you want today, and something like that. And Allah said, when you turn the back and you parent, I turn my back to you too. So what about when you ch child? You don't have any zam, or you have zam? No, you have no zam. And, and, and how many years you? I will start? answer this. I will answer this. Okay. But I just want to go over. Just stay with me for a second. The first experience you have of, generally, children have of lying uh, is the first sin that they experience as a sin because it's what? The definition of sin is you don't want other people to know about something that you did and you feel shy or feel bad if they find out or you'll be embarrassed if they find found out. Do you remember lying to your parents for the first time? You don't remember. Do you remember? You remember. I remember. Do you remember? I think so. You think so, right? Yeah. Maybe. Think so, yeah. Yeah, you remember the first time you... Do you remember the first time you lied to your parents? You do remember? Okay. You remember the first time you lied to your parents? How many people... So, one, two, three, four, five, six people remember out of eight. The first time lying to their parents. Okay. Because it's a traumatic experience. <laughs> Meaning, meaning it has to be traumatic, that's why you remember it, right? I mean, why else would you remember it if it wasn't traumatic? Like, and the fear that the parents will find out. Okay, the point I'm trying to make here, this really goes down deep, as you'll see. Why is there this sense, like you're born with this sense of this thing that if I do this, I don't want other people to know? According to Freud, it's even more interesting. When, with the Islamic scholars, they wouldn't just say this, but Freud is Freud. He would say anything, right? He says the first experience of sinning is when you were using the bathroom. Your first experience of the enjoyment of using a bathroom. When you're, you're pooping and it feels good, right? He says that's the first experience of what would be called the secret. Okay. You wouldn't you 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 like it, but you wouldn't tell anybody about it, would you? You never told anybody about it. So, like I said, only Freud would say such disgusting things. But he makes the point that that feeling, the point that you wouldn't tell anybody, means what? What does it tell you about yourself? It's a sin to you. 
Okay, it's a sin to you, but what does that tell you? What, what is it that's deeply rooted in, in us? The sense of... Like consciousness? Like sense of doing well? Okay, the con it has to do with consciousness. But if you feel about things you don't want to discuss... Shame? Sh okay, yeah, it's part of shame, right? You feel shame about something, what does it tell you about yourself? You did something bad, you're not good. Okay. But it means if there is a secret, then there is such a thing as good and bad. And the point we're trying to make is society didn't teach you this. Oh, okay. Society did not teach you this. People did not teach. Your parents never told you to lie is bad. But when you lied, you knew it was bad. Right? Or something happens like you, even like a little baby that pees or a toddler that pees and is not supposed to or poops and they're not supposed to, they're shy about it, right? There's a phase where a baby will poop anywhere, right? And then there's a phase when he gets to three years old, he hides, like he will, uh, hide, he will not poop in front of anyone, he'll go in secret. You know about this, right? right. When you're a little child, there's a phase where in the beginning you don't realize when you start seeing that I'm different from other people, you automatically become shy from uh, wanting to poop in front of other people. You want to close the bathroom and lock the door. Why is that part of human nature? Another phase that we go through, you probably all went through this also, when you're little boys and your mother bathes you, right? You're not shy in the beginning, but there comes a point where you're like, uh, no, you know, I need to bathe myself, <laughs> right? Because you're shy, right? Why? I mean, did society teach you these things? No. Nah. No. No. So, nah. how do you know these things? Modern psychology would like you to believe that this is things that society taught you. But what in fact, it? these are not... Huh? What did it be society? Like, what do you know Like from like kids from your age? Yeah, so from at the age of three, you somehow know that pooping in front of other no, no, people... No, I'm talking about like that showering thing. Like, what do you know? Or what? Mm, no, I don't think so, because I don't think even little kids discuss that with each other. Yes? I, I, gotta, I gotta say something is gonna be a little bit close with what you yeah. say. Yeah. When, when baby got a born, and how many days he's gonna know his daddy is mom? It's gonna take how many days or how many months? Like he's, he's feeling like this is my mom and this is my dad. How long? How, yeah, how, how long time is taking? How long does it take for the baby to figure to out? Fix in, in the no beginning, realize. this is my mom and this is my dad. Okay, so if you want to know the scientific answer for that, the answer is when a baby is born, the baby may, thinks that it is the mother, in fact. Because when it sees the mother, it doesn't recognize... There's a phase where a baby looks... I don't know if you've ever seen this, if you have kids. But there's a phase where a baby looks at its hands and says, Oh wow, these are I got hands. <laughs> You've seen this? Yeah. Have you ever seen this phase? Where a baby Somewhere. looks at his own hands and says, Wait, I got my own thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> when the baby sees the mother's face, the baby kind of thinks that it is the mother. Or it is attached to the mother, or it is part of the mother. Okay? The the when the mother when the womb when the baby is in the womb of the mother, it knows the heartbeat of the mother. It knows the heartbeat of the mother. And it knows the voice of the mother. And so when it comes out and it's in a different world, it knows the voice of the mother. And so when it hears the and it you know the vision is not completely made when a baby is born. So vision is still being developed. And you can do a basic test on the baby, like if you they can uh, show him, yes. I heard it takes eight, um, that when babies are eight months old, then their vision fully develops. Yeah, it takes time. It's not the yeah. first day. It, so even though they do testing, some basic testing on ears and eyes, they do some basic testing, but all the baby can only see two feet, like two feet far away. So if the baby is like, if you're, if you're like five feet away, it can't even like see you properly. So it sees the mother's face closely and recognizes the mother's face as the mother's face. And uh, I will tell you about Ridha when you talk about Ridha because that's where the ego is developed, right? 
I'm going to talk about some very interesting things that you're going to find you're going to find very interesting. Um, so the point is, good and bad is what. The point I'm trying to make is good and bad is deeply what deeply innate. What do I mean by innate? We are born with it. Is that how you spell innate? That's not how you spell. There's an e at the end. I double n, right? I double n something something. I think it's just innate, right? Yeah, not a fact. Something along those lines. Right and wrong is deeply what? Innate. Innate. Okay. Now, hold on. We're not done. This is the beginning, okay, of what we're discussing. Uh, this good and bad that you have that's innate, okay, later on society can change it based upon what society teaches you. But you are born with a set of ideas of right and wrong. You're born with that. Now, what does that have to do with the verse that we're reading? Don't be like the people who forgot Allah, then Allah made them forget themselves. Because that part of yourself, your, that part of your inner self, that has the knowledge of good and bad, why does you, you inside have this knowledge or innate knowledge of good and bad? Why do you think you have this innate knowledge of good and bad? Why do you have this knowledge? And like I said, we talked about a sin is a secret. What is the secret? Has to do with your knowing good and bad, right? You don't you want to hide your secret. What is behind good and bad? What can you tell me about the existence of good and bad inside you? What does it tell you? That there is a God. That's morality at least. Okay. There's morality, there's God. What else does it tell you? Yeah. You're not perfect. You're not perfect? Okay, what else does it tell you? There's a right way to do things and there's a wrong way. Like there's a okay, yeah. So basically, this tells you that you have a inner self. There's an inner world. There's an inner universe. Each one of us has an inner self. Each one of us has an inner self, something that's not part of this physical body, right? And this inner self knows this, and because it knows this, it knows God. There's no, if there's right and wrong, there has to be a God, otherwise there's no God. So this is the secret, and this is the bigger secret. Wasn't there a philosopher that argued that, um, I think it's called the empiricist challenge. Okay. Where it's, um, there might be some right, or like there might be some constant in the universe that tells you what is right and wrong, but like as we, but we as humans, we cannot, we, there's no way of, of it like affecting us. He's saying even if there was some moral truth, I think this is like an atheist argument. Yeah, so basically th that would only be true if, the, if there is a God, but he has absolutely nothing to do with us. Right? He just created the universe, just created us, but he's not really interested in us. Why am I, why am I going through this? I mean, why is this significant? What does this have to do with changing yourself? We'll talk about that. But first, I want to establish the fact that there is an inner self, an inner reality that you have, that I have, we all have. Right? Guys? Come on. Okay. Now, if there's good and bad, there has to be a God. Uh, actually, there has to be accountability. And then that means that there has to be one who's taking the accounting. Now, when the Qur'an says, do not be like those people who forgot Allah, therefore they forgot them themselves. Now tell me what does it mean? You don't know the difference between good and bad if you forget God because you don't think there's someone taking account, right? Of every 
So, let's say you're born with this, right? Yeah. And this is somewhere behind. Okay. This is in the background of your mind. Okay. Because you, this, is not, this is not in the background. This is actually interacting with you. Mm -hmm. Right? This is actually interacting with your mind. But this is in the background. The more you know this, the stronger gets this. Right? The less you have this, the less you'll have this. But over time, as you approach the world around you. So the less value you have, the less you know. Can you say that again? Okay, so the more you're born with this, yeah. right? And this part, even though you have this, but you're born with this interacting with you on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. But this is not really, this is in the background. Okay. Like you got a computer program, in the, in the, you see the interface, it's interacting with you. Yeah. But behind it you have the services that are running of the computer, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The idea of God is in the background because it's a re logical result of this. Oh, okay. But what the interface that you are dealing with is, oh, I, you know, I should, should I do that? I lied to my parents. I did this. I did that, right? Yep. Yeah. As you grow up, as you grow up, your fitra can change. There's another very important point, point that I want to, before I come back here, let me explain this same thing to you from a different perspective. It's very actually interesting. How can you measure how uh, natural you are in the way Allah created you? How can you test that you are Salim al Fitra or not? How can, how can you test if you are in a natural state, in your state of Fitra or not? Tell me. How can you test if someone has a good heart? Yes. It's by um, seeing if he, he trusts to, uh, if somebody gives him something, he'll automatically think he has to give him something back in return. Oh, he's saying yes. thank you or something. Yes, that's right. I've mentioned this before. The more a person feels gratitude, the more a person feels gratitude. You did something good, you automatically need to feel like I need to do something back, right? If you feel no gratitude for somebody does something, you know, somebody gives you a thousand dollars and you're like, well, unless you're a millionaire, but if you're poor like me, somebody gives you a million dollars, you want to thank the person. Thank you, right? Yeah. So if somebody does good to you and you feel back that you want to do good to them, that is the measurement of how much fitra you, your strong, your fitra, your human nature is. Now, how does that relate to this? I'm going to come to you. How does this relate to what I'm just saying? The idea of gratitude. Gratitude or shukr. How does it relate to this? And how does it relate to this? Come on, guys. How does gratitude relate to the knowledge of good and bad within inside you? And how does shukr relate to the knowledge of the inner self within you? So how does shukr relate to the knowledge of your inner self? And how does, what is it, the other part? And how does it relate to knowledge of good and bad? Mm. The more your shukr is there, the more gratitude you feel, the stronger these concepts inside you will be. Yes? Yes, that's that's related to that. Oh, you gotta say like Yeah, you could say it that way too. But sh gratitude also is connected with the sense of good and bad, right? Yeah. Uh, why would you give gratitude to somebody if somebody does good to you? Why do you say thank you if there's no good and bad, right? right. That I idea of gratitude is within us. Now, now, just the way Imam Ghazali explains it. Just let me quickly go over that one second and then we'll go to the next phase, which you'll, because I'm, I'm trying to make a point here. When you're young, your only world is your parents. Mm -hmm. When you get older, your world is your relatives. Your world gets bigger, right? You. And when you get older, the world gets even bigger and you see, oh, I'm not just, in, it, my whole family is involved in taking care of me when you get even bigger and you see the universe is actually taking care of me, Imam Ghazali says it's just a step there that you finally realize, it's a leap. 
you see everything's taking care of me the sun the moon the water everything is involved in taking care of me and if you have a strong sense of gratitude you're going to want to thank you someone even you know one thing that even atheists say what's what's the flaw of being an atheist do you know there's no one to thank the flaw of being an atheist is what no one to thank there's no one to thank and even if somebody does good to you you can thank them but there's no real ultimate person to thank for anything good happening to you because it's all by chance okay so when you do shukr shukr relates to the idea of good and bad it creates that inner world of yours okay it creates that inner world of yours and if there is shukr then there has to be ultimately be this God has to exist if there's why what are why do we innately have a sense of gratitude why do we innately have the sense of right and wrong why do we innately have the sense of if i did something wrong i want to keep it a secret why do i innately have the sense of if i do something wrong i feel guilty don't tell me that society has taught every single person all of these traits no these are innately human you're born with this now why does this how does this translate into the verse don't be like those people who forget allah because allah will make you forget yourself how does it how does it relate how does that what does that verse mean in the light of that verse what is in the light of this what does that verse mean oh i get it cuz if you if you forget allah right so you don't thank someone for your actions right like or anything good happening to you and if something good happened to you you have a sense of bad and goodness already like innate right cuz you have shukr cuz you have a realization that you need to thank someone around the, the, the world around you right and shukr and in your inner self is also based off that shukr too in a sense what happens as a result when these things when you say to yourself to your mind that oh there is no god oh there's no real thank you to anyone these things they fade away your inner self what fades with it away and all that you are left with is your body the inner world dies the inner world fades away there's no sh- there's no sense of gratitude there's no sense of right and wrong the things that extra they're like inner muscles right they're like you have muscles of your arms and muscles of your legs So gratitude is like your arms for example that concept of right and wrong is like your legs for example the more you uh exercise them the more you'll have them when you start denying those inner realities of yours your that inner self of yours will fade away and all that will be left is the shell the husk the seed is gone just all only the husk around the seed remains So now you will go to the like a lady goes to the I like this example a lady goes to a therapist and says oh well I'm 40 years old now and I'm not so guys don't find me that much attractive and they don't flirt with me and I feel so bad about myself you only relate to your which your own physic your only your physical presence your physical reality and you forget about your inner reality you forget yes got us some questions here now you talking about this and like today like today maybe the corner in white house or somebody give me diamond or somebody give me something expensive really expensive mm. and i'm going to be also like a lot of people like this my, my cousin or my friend or some anybody give me something like diamond and i'm going to like happy you know I'm going to be like, "Wait, I'm going to be crazy something like that." Because I saw the demon, I'm going to be crazy. Or maybe one of my cousin, my friend is going to be crazy about that. So I feel like I'm not going to be like more happy because somebody give me the demon. You know, I'm going to be happy with the Allah give me the eyes and look at that demon with that. Shukrulillah 
confess. Yeah. You know, between the devil and my eye, which one is, is a value? It's my eyes. Yes. So, the simple words that we say, like Alhamdulillah, for example, all the time we say Alhamdulillah, they help keep you alive, your inner reality alive. We are saying thank you Allah, right? They're helping to keep your inner world alive. Now, how does this relate to the practical world? Now, let me go to that side in a second. So, uh, that wasn't a question. I didn't ask a question yet. <laughs> okay. Tahir, how does this relate to the practical world we live in? So, yeah, what I explained so far. Life is a ninety percent. What happens to you and ten percent how you react to it? Okay. What like what happens on the inside reflects on the outside. Okay. What happens when your inner world fades? And how the other question with that is how to not let your inner world fade when your reality is such that your inner world is more real for you than your outer world. When what? Your inner world is more real for you than your outer world. Compared to your outer world being more real for you than your inner world. How does that happen? No, 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 wait. We'll talk about self-esteem if we get there. How, what, imagine a human being who knows, who has more, he feels more real with his inner self than he does with his body. Oh, he becomes uh, pure. Uh, the level of the uh, Robert Shadow, right? Okay. You oh. like that that <laughs> symbolism. <laughs> oh, maybe his his real world sucks so much that his inner world is like the only thing going for him. No, he, that he, happens actually sometimes. Like or, a but, uh, or he, but mas he masters his outer world. He's able to master his outer world. When his inner world is real, tell me what what are the what happens inside somebody whose inner life is real. This and this is real. If there's good and bad, he definitely feels shy for doing wrong things. So he's a pious person. He right? has definitely gratitude when somebody gives him something. He uh, he has a strong sense of God, a strong sense of right and wrong. Right. He's a taqwa, right? When you have more shukr. But tell me more. I mean, this person whose inner self. Is alive. It's real. It's it. It interacts with him more than the physical world. He knows him. what he says, and he tries not it's to do his it. His soul lets him connect with the. What's the very first thing that will happen? The very first thing you can tell me about this person that has an inner self that's alive. The righteous person. Self awareness. Awareness. <laughs> I said that like ten comments ago. Self awareness. He'll be because he that inner world is alive. He's aware of what he is thinking and feeling. Right? Yes. Right. If that when that world is not alive, there is no such thing as self-awareness. There's only body awareness. So don't be like those people who forget Allah and then Allah makes them forget about themselves. Meaning, be like those people because the khaliful ma'ni is be like those people who know their inner selves so that they know because when you know when all these traits the good traits of right and wrong the traits of shukr the, the idea of shyness when you do something wrong when these exist the automatic conclusion of those traits is that there has to be a God that's yes just, that's just the basic path to righteousness that's just this is just step A this is step A, is to make this, give it an injection of life. To give your inner self an injection of life is just the st first step. Basically. So we have to be in control of our inner self. Let me know. So how do you become control of your inner self? To be like... Uh, okay, so the Quran answers. Look at verse, the ayah before that now. Right? Yeah. So first of all, go ahead and read ayah number 
uh, 19 again to yourself and just think about simple words but a very deep concept. Huh? Jaya 18 you said? Go ahead, read Aya number 19 first and then 18. But I want you to read Aya number 19 and realize that it's simple words but very deep in concept. The concept behind that verse, number 19, is extremely, extremely important. Which is not by accident that this, after this, the biggest, largest uh, flower vase of Allah's names is mentioned. And I'll connect it with that in a second. How do you give yourself that injection? How do you give yourself that what? Injection. That injection that I'm talking about. This is what we're going to discuss. So... What does ayah number 19 say? Uh, do not be like those who forget about God, who will make them forget themselves. These are the simple people. Okay, what's the ayah before that? Now, um, this is where actually the topic starts. Believers have fear of God. They so must see what it has done for the future. Have fear of God, for He is all aware of what you do. No, that's a very bad translation. I remember. <laughs> I didn't say it. Ya ayyuhal ladhina you people who believe ittaqullah, fear Allah. And let your nafs see what it has sent for tomorrow. What it has what? Sent for tomorrow. Meaning what? The living soul is the one who doesn't live thinking 10 years or 20 years. He's ready to die what? Today. Tomorrow. The Prophet said, وسلم, if you wake up in the morning, don't expect yourself to live beyond the night. And if you sleep at night, yes. Yes, he said. Because what is let me let me explain something to you about death. One one way to understand death or the all the ibadah that we do, that it, the, what is it all leading for? What is it for? It's for the death. Right? All of the ibadah that we do. I mean, that's one side of it from a religious perspective, but now from a non-religious perspective. Everyone agrees the survival instinct is a strong instinct in human beings. We all want to, what? Well, Survive. We want to somehow escape, what? Death. Escape death. death. <laughs> we want to escape death. I want to escape death. Do you want to escape death? I'd like to escape death. Do you want to escape death? I'd like to escape death. We all want to escape death. And so, one way is, let's try to look at technology and see where it takes us. Maybe it'll make us live 200 years. Maybe 300 years. But ultimately, you know, uh, it, you have to still face death. If man enjoys all his life, but his death brings him the biggest sorrow, then that was his ending, right? It's like the, the one who laughs last, laughs, laughs best. Most, right? yeah. The one who laughs last, laughs best. In the same way, if you are not ready for death, when death comes and you feel like, I'm not ready to go, right? And the angel of death is there and you're not advancing towards him, you're moving away from him. It's such a, like all... Everything boils down to that one moment in life. Is that instinct of survival and how you can, for that moment, surpass it. You can't surpass it if you're only living in your body. You can't surpass death if you're only living in... Because the body's instinct is to what? Survive. Survive. If the inner self has done what the inner self tells you to do, do good deeds, do good deeds, do good deeds, do ibadah, do things you don't want to do, don't do the things your lust is telling you to do, then when you meet that, this inner self is actually a little bit more ready to go. Right? But everything comes down to that final moment, the moment of death. So, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanat taqullaha wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat li ghadim wa taqullah. Allah says again, fear me. Now the question is, how do you make that happen? I'm going to answer that for you, Tahir, because I know that's what you want to know. How do you get to that point? 
وَلْتَنْزُ النَّفْسُ مَا قَدَّمَتْ لِغَدِي وَاتَّكُوا اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ And Allah knows what you do. وَلَا And forget it. So what Allah wants you to do on one end is see what you sent for tomorrow. And on the other hand is meaning what you sent for after death. Right? And fear Allah. You can't fear Allah if you don't believe He exists. Or you can't fear Allah if your inner life is not, re is not alive. You have to develop that. Because you have to go beyond the good and bad and all the other things inside you, finally to the thing that's behind it all, inside yourself, which is Allah, and then fear Him. I don't know if that just made sense to you. Can you repeat that? Okay. The sense of good and bad is, the, is in the front of your mind. The sense of God is not in the front of your mind, it's in the back. So your inner self has to be very strong to feel what's in the back. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. But the, mm. the part I'm confused on is when it says, and let every soul look to what provision it has. Yeah. Now, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just not grasping like that. Meaning for tomorrow, for the day of judgment. What are your good deeds? What have you done for the next life? So I think, let every soul look for what it has done on, a, for, on the day of judgment? Yes, that's right. That's what it's trying to say. That's the day of provision. Okay. Right? Zadul Ma'ad, like Imam Niqiyam's book, the day of uh, the, the preparing for provisions, meaning for the hereafter. You have provisions in this life, right? You have your clothes and food, provisions. But you need provisions for the next life. What have you prepared for the next life? And that's the whole point. What... Why will yourself prepare for the next life if it doesn't even be believe that there's an inner world? Meaning there, there's only this world, right? You may in your mind believe there's a hereafter, but if your inner world doesn't exist, you're not really going to prepare for it. So now the question is, how do you give yourself that injection to make your inner self come alive? Okay, so that we will now answer. Now go to ayah number 20. Very quickly, we'll pass over that, and then ayah number 21 will answer the question. Look, the people of the fire and the people of paradise are not equal. And the point is that the first two verses, 18 and 19, show that disparity between them. They're two different types of people, two very different types of people. One is, and that's why one goes to hell, and that's why one goes to paradise. And the people of Jannah, they are the successful ones. Now, the answer. The answer is twofold. First answer. If we had sent down this book on a mountain, why mountain? Why Allah says the word mountain here? It's the closest point to the heavens? No. Because mountain is strong? No. Yes. Because you say, well, you know, I'm so bad, I'd, I'd really like to do what Qur'an is saying, but my heart is so bad. It's like rock. My heart is like a rock. I, I'm not, I, I mean, there's something wrong with me. I don't change. I can't change. There's something wrong with me. My heart is like as hard as a mountain. But then Allah says, لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل If we revealed this Qur'an or brought this Qur'an down on the mountain, or if we brought this Qur'an down on a, on a rock-solid heart that Allah describes in Qur'an in another place, ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ Then your hearts became hard. ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكْ فَهِيَ كِالْهِجَارَةِ أَوْ أَشَدُّ قَسْوَةِ If your hearts became like stone, even harder than that. Allah says, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ عَلَى جَبَلٍ لَرَعَيْتَهُ خَاشِيًا مُتَصَدِّيًا مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ You would see that bringing down this Qur'an on the, on the heart or on the mountain would rent, break the mountain, like destroy the mountain and subdue the mountain. So, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ عَلَى جَبَلٍ If we had put down this Qur'an on a mountain, لَرَأَيْتَهُ You would definitely, not that you will see, لَرَأَيْتَهُ يعني لَمْ تَعْكِيدٍ Definitely this will be the case. لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِيًا مُتَصَدِّيًا مِنْ خَشِيَةِ اللَّهِ It would humble itself and break. And it would break, and it used the word break twice. It would be subdued in the fear of Allah. You want the fear of Allah? You're like, how can I have fear of Allah? Well, the injection you need to put the fear of Allah in you 
is to build a relationship with the Quran. The Quran. Yes. I'm just having a really, like, I guess a new topic causing questions, but how yeah, do you build a relationship with the Quran? Okay, no, that's a very good question. So, but you see the, po the, the, the flow of things, right? Yeah. So far? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على That now, خشية, the fear of Allah that was mentioned in ayah number 18 is now mentioned here. On ayah number 20. 21. These are examples Allah says. We set them for people. So that they might reflect. So they might reflect on these par this parable. What is Allah trying to say with this parable? Why did he put it here? Right? Okay. Then Allah says, then read ayah number 22 and ayah, ayah number 23. Allah's names are mentioned 18 times in here. Wallahu alladhi la ilaha illahu alimu al-ghaybi wa al-shahadati wa rahman al-rahim. Wallahu alladhi la ilaha illahu al-malik al-kudus al-salam al-mu'min al-muhaymin al-aziz al-jabbar al-mutakabbir. Subhanallah yamma yushrikun. Next verse. هو الله الخالق الباري المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم. Eighteen times Allah's names are mentioned. Why? What's the point here? Those attributes that need to be in your inner self, those attributes that need to be part of your inner world, those attributes of Allah that you need to have in your inner world, in yourself. How do you develop them? You develop them by reading the Quran. And the attributes, what are the attributes Allah is going to put inside you? Now, number one, huwa Allahu alladhi la ilaha illahu. Number one, the faith that there is no Allah, making this part of yourself strong in the belief in Allah. Then Allah says, in ayah number 23, huwa Allahu alladhi la ilaha illahu al-malik. That he is the king, right? Al-Quddus, he is pure. What do you want to be? You want to be pure, right? As-salam, the source of peace. What do you want to be inside yourself? You want to have peace inside yourself. Al-mu'min, guardian of, of your... Uh, mu'min means guardian. So what do you want? You want to have some guard... You want to have guardian inside you. Al-aziz, aziz means many things, but aziz means something near you. Like something like when you love something and you want it to be near you. You want to be a person when people are near you, they love being near you. Al-aziz. Al-Jabbar, but this for Allah only. Al-Jabbar, meaning the fear of Allah. Al-Mutakabbir. Okay, these two are specifically for Allah. Then, who Allah al-Khaliq al Meaning Meaning, when you learn the attributes of Allah, it will help you make your inner world. Inject the Qur'an and make your inner self like Allah by listening to Him. Yes? Can you say again, what, what's the signs that Allah loves you? There are a lot of signs that Allah loves you, but you can never be 100% uh, uh, sure if Allah loves you. A lot of people are under the impression Allah loves them, but Allah may not love them at all. Wait, so, so he put down all of his names, starting from Maya 23. In order to make this and this stronger. But why, okay. so why wouldn't... Why wouldn't it just say that, like, we did this for this, or for this, or what? for this? It, because these names are attributing to him, right? Because, because the purpose of the names there has more than one purpose. So, to say any one purpose wouldn't be justice. But to just put it there, and, and Allah says, think about it, why I put it there, then you can come up with a hundred different reasons why. Okay. Like I said, we're just looking at the, the human mind, applying human mind on the Qur'an. Right? So, one of the things that you need to do is you need to build a relationship with Qur'an. And that makes a very good point to how do you build a relationship with Qur'an. First of all, do not use that translation. This okay? One? Yeah, because that's not going to really help you. But what's but, the best translation? Yeah. Uh, I like a few of them. That I can tell you which ones, but I'm not going to put it over the video right now. Let me just uh, wipe this off and, uh, and then I will go into some of the more practical things that you can do. So, so, yeah, relationship with Qur'an, there's a few things you need to do that can help. Uh, first of all, Qur'an. First, 
take a translation, any translation, and take a pencil and read ten verses every day. Just ten. Ten lines. Ten verses. Well, the actual Arabic or the translation? No, translation. Okay. Arabic's not going to help you. So, you read the translation ten lines, and you make notes. Oh, I don't understand this. Oh, this doesn't make sense to me. Oh, wow, I find this interesting. Oh, I, this is what I was reading yesterday. Or this is what I was thinking about yesterday. Right? You, every ten lines you read it, you think about it, and you think what Allah is trying to say to you. What is the guidance Allah is trying to give you? You do that every day before you go to sleep. So, the one is... You read Qur'an, read translation, read translation, and put down notes. Your own personal, private notes on your thoughts and reflection. You don't have to be a scholar to make reflections on Qur'an. You could be any Muslim who reads the word of Allah and says, Okay, this is what Allah is saying to me. It's good enough. Okay, first thing. Second thing. Your long-term goal should be what? Your long-term goal must be to learn Arabic. I mean, you're going to do studies, you're going to become a doctor. Yeah. Right? I mean, you can become a doctor, but you can't least learn Arabic language, which is easy compared to that. Yeah. I mean, six months. Take six months of uh, concentrated effort, part-time concentrated effort, six months, and you will begin to understand Qur'an. Okay, so long-term your goal should be, I don't want any barriers between me and the Qur'an. Okay, another thing that you could do is have halaqas. Halaqa, how do you have a halaqa? Tell me. You gather your friends and say, okay, we're all going to read this chapter or this verse, 10 verse, 20 verse, 30 verse. We're going to sit down and it works out really, really beautifully. Because you sit down with a group of friends and you sit down in a circle. No one's a leader as such. Somebody may know more than the others. But everyone sits down in a circle. Okay? And you start off by reciting the Quran and then you translate it and you go verse by verse and say, okay, what do you think about this verse? And what do you say, think about this verse? And what do you think about this verse? And you go around the circle. Then you do ayah number two and then ayah number three. Whatever the goal is. And then everybody gives their reflections on what they got from reading those 10 verses, for example, 10 verses, what they got from reading those 10 verses. And you will find that that discussion would be extremely productive for you. And it, yes? Is it like a Bible study? No, they, they... Well, they don't do it this way, but yeah, kind of like a Bible study, but you would have a collective Quranic study. It's called a halaqa. You know, you would do it in a halaqa form. You gather your friends together, you choose a surah, and you can all read up on your own what it's trying to say. But not only don't stay limited to what other people are saying, or what I say. Add your own. That's your Qur'an will be your own reflections on Qur'an. Right? So that's the third thing that you can do as far as Qur'an is concerned. So long term is learn Arabic. Individually you can read the translation and take notes. And then in, in a collective way of further enhancing. Because when you hear other people... If I hear what you have to say about certain verses, I'll definitely, I know for sure because of my experience, I'll benefit from anyone in any halaqa, a group of people giving their reflections, they'll definitely say things I didn't think of. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, there is always benefit of going to halaqas, creating neighborhood halaqas, where you have Quranic halaqas and you discuss the Quran, and that's where you really begin to, like, like, you know, get on the same wavelength of beginning to see, okay, wait, this is a very meaningful uh, endeavor. This is a very meaningful thing that's happening. I would like to establish a halaqa in this masjid with some of the kids, uh, I mean, like you guys, if it was possible, but I don't know if it's possible, uh, where we take some verses of Quran and study it together. And I mean, study it together in a sense, we all have an input on what it's trying to say. And then usually, sometimes what they would do is like have me speak at the, at the end of everyone's reflections. But it doesn't have to be that way. I can give my reflections and everybody can give their reflections too. So uh, those are just some ways that you can relate to the Qur'an. Uh, I, it does not have to be that you read from the beginning to the end. It doesn't have to be that way. Uh, generally, what's very, very interesting about Qur'an, I'll share one of the miracles of Qur'an with you, is generally... If you're an introvert, you start from the first page. And if you're not an introvert, you usually like browse through a book.
for like some interesting title or some interesting part uh, or pictures, right? Uh, so if you're an introvert, you're going to get the longer surahs, right? And if you're an extrovert, you're going to get the shorter surahs. So that kind of fits in, right? They're shorter, you're an extrovert. Yeah. But, but they're more illusionary, like, what is it talking, it's going to leave you like in a mystery, like, what is that trying to say? Because they're not so easy to understand, those, those end parts, uh, the end surahs. Um, anyway, so this is the first thing that I wanted to say, is that you have to take seriously the study of Qur'an. Now, if you add to that the other things that I was talking about, uh, which is this. Because the Qur'an will give you different meanings as you do this, okay? Now, this becomes, this is another part of the, uh, um, I'm going to st uh, stop here and let you just have a small discussion with you guys and then decide if I want to go further or not. But, you know, you have your heart, as I was saying, right? And you have the gates of sins, right? Your eyes, your ears, your mouth, what you say with your mouth, your feet. And, like I was telling Tahir, right, you want to, like, maybe put a focus on this for a month, and 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 this for a month, right? So you see, like, the sins you have, you write a journal, basically. And you try to close these, each of these doors of sins, okay? When you close these doors of these sins, then what happens is that, uh, just like if there is a <laughs> vase that has a flicker of light in it. This flicker of light inside you is your fitra, is your nature. It's that part of you that we just discussed. It's that part of you that knows right and wrong. It's that part of you that knows uh, Allah. It knows gratitude. That thing, there's this thing inside you that knows these things, okay? And then there's the oil that's burning the light, which we will discuss in a second. And I was telling Tahir this, that when you sin, it's like you're doing something to cover this. And so what happens? That light doesn't what? Come out. Right? So you have to clean it. Right? Clean it so that light will again start to radiate out. Okay? So this is what Qur'an teaches us. Qur'an teaches us there is a natural disposition there. It has guidance in it. It can tell you something. It can tell you something true about yourself. But you have to let it, you have to stop these sins. And, and what's interesting is that this is not just in an Islamic tradition. It's very important to realize this historically speaking. Look, how, did, how, how have people purified themselves to feel, to feel their inner life? What, is, what have people done traditionally in history? What do people usually do? Throughout history, you want to purify yourself. You want to see God. You want to seek God. You want to be Meditate. a better human. Huh? Meditate. But more than that, where, what have people done in society? You become a monk and you go away from human beings, right? You become a nun and you go away from humanity. You go away from society, right? So that you're not tempted and that this remains clean. So that no matter, even if you're a Buddhist, even if you're a Hindu, even if you're a nun, even if you're a monk, that makes sense. huh? So that makes sense. Yeah, no matter who you are, you at least, if you are even a monk, a Christian monk, you will feel that fitra there. Because you're not sinning. You see what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. Because when you're no longer, you don't have the opportunities to sin, right? You, there's, no, there's no distractions, there's no Facebook, there's no internet, there's no there's no rock and roll or whatever there is, right? When there, even if you're a Christian monk, if this glass of yours is not sinning, and there's nothing, or no, nothing covering this glass, okay? Nothing covering this glass, this light will radiate out. And he will see some truth. He will see some truth. Even if he's Christian, even if he's Hindu, even if he's Parsi, even if he's Buddhist, no matter what he is, if he's not sinning, he, and guess what? Another interesting point. All the people that do meditation and they leave and they focus on the same sins. 
they all have the same idea. You focus on death, you focus on the higher power, if you're Buddhist, you focus on, uh, you focus, uh, if you, you know, Buddhists don't believe in God, but they believe in not sinning. And think of how strange this is. Like, if you're going to be a Buddhist monk, you're going to be told to reflect on your death, just like Muslims are told. If you're a Buddhist monk, you're told you cannot do, you cannot steal, you cannot cheat, you cannot lie. They have all these rules that we would say that a pious person should be doing, but it's a Buddhist. He doesn't even believe in God because they know through their experience of separating a person from society, something happens that something inside becomes alive. You get enlightenment of some sort, that that inner part of you becomes clean and you begin to feel something real from the inside. So, how do you do this? Now, what is the role of Qur'an in this? The role of Qur'an... So you're born with this. You're born with this. This is not Qur'an. You're born with this. What happens with Qur'an is, if you clean this out, at least somewhat, and then you read Qur'an, then you read Qur'an. This is Nur, and this is Nur. When you read Qur'an, and that light is inside you, and that light that's inside you, when the two meet, when the two meet, when the light on the outside meets, meaning through your mind, meets the light on the inside, inside it becomes super illuminated. You know, and like... I, give the example when you play a video game and then you're like supercharged right yeah you go when these two synchronize the Quran and this when they synchronize then reality the doors of the reality of the unseen will open for you you will get access to that part of yourself that puts the oil in here that is called or has to do with your ruh. When you start doing this, when you are at this level, what happens as a result? Now, I will show you what will happen as a result. I discussed this with Tahir, but I'm going to show it to him in a different way. What happens as a result is, three, two things are happening. You have your aql. What is aql? No. Your heart. No. The intelligence and how you use it. Okay, you have your knowledge and how you're able to use it. Use it. Amal. And you have your qalb, your heart. And you have your nafs. Over here, I'm going to explain something very important from. I already explained this to Tahir, but it's important to connect everything. It's important for me to repeat this. Okay? So, the nafs says. Me, the nuf says, me and now. I want it now, I want it now, I want it now, I want it now. Just like when the baby cries, I want it now, I want it now, I want it now, the milk, right? The nuf says, now. And the nuf says, me, me, me. Okay? Now, what I want to explain to you is this, is that your heart, your heart, did I explain this to you about positive emotions and negative mm -hmm. emotions? Okay. So, your heart will either have positive emotions or negative emotions. But when your aql, your aql, when your aql has, has joined the heart with positive emotions, then it takes over the nafs. The two take over the nafs. And you're no longer interested in the no. now and me. Your soul becomes more like an angel and you think in terms of not me but in terms of we. That's why in Fatiha we say wa we worship you and we seek your help. We. 
Because when you're truly, truly close to Allah, you don't just ask for yourself. You are more interested in asking for all the people. Just like the angels, they ask forgiveness for all the people. Okay? Okay, so why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I'm telling you when the two lights meet, okay, the two lights meet, the one in your heart and then the ruh, the doors to the ruh open. And what do I mean by that? The doors to the ruh open. Facing the soul. So you start having true dreams. You start having what? True dreams. True dreams is one of the things that happens. What else happens? You see things that other people don't see. You, you would, you, you like to, uh, you like to spend time in ibadah. You enjoy doing ibadah. You like enjoying having uh, conversations with Allah. You enjoy doing tasbih. You enjoy doing Quran. You enjoy the things that have to do with that inner world, right? And the things of the body and the outer world become less important. And the things of the inner world become more important. Right? When you are able to accomplish this. But when you do does, that, does that change your personal behavior as well? Like, no, not really. So if you're it just changes your person. values, likes, and dislikes. So now how do you reach this? Okay, so one thing I said is you read, you read Quran, right? That's one way to do it. What's the other thing that you can do? Namaz. No, but I'm t talking about key, key points. Oh, learn learn uh, Arabic? No, no, no. Key, key points. Oh. Number one is Quran. Injection of Quran. Yes, number oh, one. Um, practice like self-restraint? No. Second is be with the righteous people that you want to be like. This one very, very important thing is everyone should have or find like an Imam Rochelle or, or somebody they like and they're like, this is what I want to strive to be like. Somebody better than you. Not in dunya, but in, in the spiritual sense. People that, you, I want to be like this person. I want to master life like this person, right? I want to be like this person. So, you have to be kunuma sadiqeen. Ya yuhladheena amanu kunuma sadiqeen. All you people who believe, be with the people that are righteous. Because their heart will affect your heart. Their light, inner light, will affect your inner light. Their inner selves and their inner reality will affect your inner reality. So when you, so number one is Quran, number two is be with the righteous people. And number three is what? Which was what you were referring to, but it's, there's a broader word for it. Keep doing good, keep doing good, keep doing good, keep doing good, keep doing good. Self-awareness? like self -like. No, no, no. Keep doing good. So the three are Quran. <coughs> Be with the good people that you look up to. And number three, do good. Keep doing good, keep doing good, keep doing good. Okay, those are the three things. Relationship with Quran, find the right people, and keep focusing on doing the good things. And soon you'll find your heart will change. Okay, you can turn this off for a second.